Thanks, Zach. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for attending. Uh, let's get started. <clears throat> a little bit of background about ArborJet. It's a privately held company, guys, uh, that was started in 2000. So this is our 20 year anniversary. Uh, we purchased a controlling interest in a call gel and BioPro, and we launched our ArborRx line this year that we're really excited about. Uh, we design and develop, manufacture our own products, and we're really committed to be environmentally responsible. So uh, we're very excited, and let's get into the talking about the spotted lantern fly. Uh, here's a little listing of the field support. Uh, I'm your Mid Atlantic uh, manager. Kevin Brewer would be the Northeast. Uh, Kevin Lewis would be the Midwest, and JB Tour Southeast. And, and as we go further west, we've got Jay Goffner, Emmett, Corey, and Marianne and Don. So, uh, and our commercial side, which be would be our turf, is Rebecca and Eric. So. Thanks guys, let's get started. So invasive pests, they've increased. You know, we've dealt with the emerald ash borer, uh, Asian longhorn uh, beetle, gypsy moth, and the uh, polyphagous shot hole borer, which is on the west coast. And now we have beech leaf disease, but the spotted lanternfly has, I would say kind of been Brian's and I's nemesis, uh, uh, how, how it started. And, uh, you know, we started out doing some emerald ash borer treatments, and then we began working together on the spotted lanternfly, and I'm really excited to talk about it. Uh, it was discovered in Berks County in 2014, and, and it's spreading rapidly through there. Um, it attacks over 70 different host species, uh, you know, including Atlantis, uh, walnuts, maples, birch, sycamores, and we'll talk about that. Uh, it's laying eggs on many different uh, surfaces. Uh, it's having uh, four different instars, and, and we're going to talk about that. And the big thing for you guys is it's really a nuisance. You know, it's going to create uh, honeydew, black sooty mold, and, and, and in the long run, it's probably damage, damaging our trees as many times as it's attacking it. And we're not really seeing any natural predators or anything like that. And we're going to discuss control options as we move forward. Uh, Brian, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I'm good with that. It's a, it's a very different bug from anything I've ever dealt with before. And I, I keep hearing researcher after researcher at the university level say the same thing. Absolutely. Uh, so it's been found in these states. Uh, it, it, it's a hitchhiker. Uh, it, it, it's been moved by pallets uh, into the Virginia area, uh, you know, so it, it's definitely moving. Uh, the, there may not be high populations, but unless you're really looking for it, it's, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, and we're going to show you some of those pictures of that, but it's definitely an interesting bug. Um, Brian, do you want to talk about uh, the quarantines? Yep, yeah, this was uh, just in, earlier in March this year that the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture essentially doubled the number of quarantine counties in Pennsylvania. And what they did a little bit differently this time was you can see the shaded blue counties are uh, in quarantine. And with the Department of Agriculture, if you're in Pennsylvania, if you have any type of business at all, essentially you need to have a uh, permit that is uh, attained through the Department of Agriculture. You can also go to Penn State Extension uh, website, which is just extension.psu.edu. And there's an application uh, process you can find right there. Uh, more importantly, what I really appreciate with the way that they did the map this time is you can see the municipalities highlighted in the dark blue, and that is where the breeding populations are. So if you're doing any kind of work in those dark blue county uh, uh, municipalities, uh, especially within those counties, keep your eyes out while you're out working on properties. And if you see spotted lanternflies on the properties you're on, you do need to report it to, uh, report it to again, the extension website, or you can call the uh, PDA hotline, which I, I don't recall at the moment. It's, it's uh, something bad bug, but uh, extension website for Penn, uh, Penn State is the better way to do that. And it will get documented and somebody will follow up with it. Um, and also I'll add, just because you don't see that, um, don't you, you don't see an area highlighted on that map doesn't mean you shouldn't be aware, especially when you look at Mifflin County and where it borders there uh, with a county that's not in the quarantine, be aware, uh, be looking for it. And if you put your eyes out there, it helps with the net that we see 
a greater picture out of it. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. So uh, <clears throat> these pictures here are some of the egg masses, older and new. Uh, this is what the bug looks like. Uh, this is a picture of the fourth instar. Uh, this are some photos that Brian took, but look how hard it is to see on that river birch. You know, um, this is, I believe, a silver maple. It, it's actually laid under the bark. So very difficult to see. Uh, it hides, it'll do rusty things, uh, any, any place you wouldn't expect it. Pine trees, you know, they're not feeding on pine trees, but they'll lay eggs on it if it's near food sources. Uh, anything else that we could add to that, Brian, you think at this point? It's pretty much any um, semi-hard object. Uh, I've seen it right down to couch cushions. Um, it tends to be underside sheltered areas, not always. Um, oftentimes, if one lays in an area, oftentimes others will begin laying in the same area. And so you'll find a, one branch on a tree that's completely slathered with egg masses. But um, they're difficult to see. Uh, they blend in. They, they start as that bright white when they're first laid, and then they usually fade back to that tannish color, uh, usually with just a couple days' time that the color fades out. Um, that picture on the lower left with the bright white, underneath that is actually an older egg mass. If you can make out, the covering has turned to that brown already. And uh, so it, it fades pretty quick and they're tough to see. Absolutely. Uh, so this is the lantern and fly life cycle. Uh, typically, they'll be laying their eggs October, or uh, they'll be in eggs from October to June. And then we'll see the hatching of first sun star in May uh, through June. I believe last year we had a little bit of early hatch in some areas. It was April because of the warmer weather. So we may want to watch that. I, I believe, tell me if I'm wrong, Brian, but it's based on degree days uh, that's, on that. That's correct. We're based on growing degree days. And so you can have an artificially warm surface, say the side of a building, if there's HVAC compressors that are blowing warm air there, It'll, it'll make an artificially warm microclimate that'll cause the hatch a little sooner. Uh, and then just being on the, the north side of a, a hill in the shade can delay hatch by weeks over the rest of the area around it. Absolutely. So uh, second end stars, June through July, uh, same with the third. And then this fourth end stars, when we start really seeing them uh, move to uh, the shade trees, your maples and stuff like that, and, and to the adults. Uh, getting into the male and female versions, uh, these are some great photos. Uh, the male would be on the top and the female are gonna have these red uh, valva furs on the tip of the abdomen. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm saying that? Yeah. Um, so v very interesting. And how, how many females do you think are in the eggs, you know, between the 30 to 50 eggs, Brian, how many would be a uh, female, I guess? The, be the best that we know right now is it's about 50, 50 male, female. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so this is a neat photo. Uh, this is them molting from the fourth in star into the adult. Uh, Brian and I had uh, one of these uh, malt in his hands. And the amazing thing to me was within 30 minutes, it was able to fly. So it was very rapid, uh, but a very neat process and moved quickly for that. Um, why is it different, guys? Well, exponential reproduction. Uh, it'll go after a wide variety of hosts. It's mobility. We, we have no predators because it's an invasive pest. Uh, birds are avoiding it. Uh, you know, in the beginning, the population really went unchecked, and, and, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, anything else to add to that, Brian, that I, I, I'm missing right now? Uh, probably the other big thing about this insect that is very different is the, the hyper um, the, the hyper awareness of customers. You might have customers with, with ash trees that are dying, and they'll never see a borer but they can't walk out their front door without getting pelted with this insect. And it's a, it's a big insect. So um, that that's probably the only other thing I would add to that. Trent, well, you guys are still talking about life cycle. Um, Brian might know this a bit better, but have you discovered uh, like a number of growing degree days 
that you should really start checking out before they hatch into their first instar? The Penn State's done some great work with this, and I saw that question. I'm gonna I'm looking at the link right now. I'm gonna put in. You can log in and check your area, and with this map link, and it'll tell you exactly when you should be looking. So give me two seconds. I'll put it in the chat box. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Um, and as you can see, too, exponential growth. You know, figuring uh, just 17 females, uh, how big this number could be now. You know, th this is just up to 2019, but think of the amount of uh, pests that are out there with this population number. I mean, it, it's really uh, scary in a sense, and we'll talk more about that as we go, but just seeing how uh, thick they can be up and down the tree is truly amazing. And uh, Brian, do you want to go ahead and talk kind of what you've been seeing out in the field? Um, yeah, basically they are, um, you, you'll see big differences in the uh, feeding based on the time of the life cycle. So the first instar, they have really small uh, proboscis. They can't get through heavy bark. So they're going to go more for the fleshy material. Uh, roses are an excellent indicator. Oftentimes, if I'm scouting a property, uh, roses, first, second, third instar are going to be where they're going to uh, be found at. That can be a uh, multi floor rose along wood lines too. Uh, there's something about that in those early instars. Uh, the next picture, you see hollyhocks. Uh, right out to uh, red twig dogwoods. As long as that leaf is fleshy and they can pierce into it, they're going to do that. Uh, as they get up in life cycle, each time they molt, they get a little bigger. The proboscis gets a little bit longer and stronger, and they can feed through heavier materials. Um, once they hit the adult phase, they can feed right through heavy bark. And Absolutely. And I think it's interesting, too, when uh, our... Uh, Dr. Don Grossman and Brian and myself did some research, uh, uh, what was it, two years ago? It, it was really interesting when we did our initial uh, uh, setup of the study, we saw all these egg sacs on the outside of the subdivision and it was neat as we watched the uh, hatching of them, how they moved back further on the property where uh, the Alanthus, uh, black walnuts and sumacs are. You know they were moving towards that that food because uh, they do prefer uh, the what's it called Brian the juggling or the the toxic part of those uh, yeah. plants correct they're, they're searching for that we, yeah we we think there's some there's some good indication from a South Korean paper uh, that came out last year and this was this in, this insect is invasive in South Korea uh, in the early 2000s they've had a very similar run as we have. Um, there's some indication that they are sequestering the toxins out of certain plants, just like the monarchs do with the milkweed to gain uh, protection from predators. And that's why birds are really leaving them alone. So with, with walnut, it would be juggling. With the alanthus, it's the alathone. We do have some uh, studies going on at Penn State this year that's going to help to confirm that, uh, confirm or, or deny it. But it looks very probable that uh, that's what's driving part of what's driving them. Cool. Uh, here's some more additional photos for you guys, adults, uh, the fourth instar, uh, some of the second and third instars with fourth instars climbing on the branches. Uh, and now I'm gonna let Brian get into talk about this study. I think it's really interesting. So yeah, this is uh, the question of how much are they actually moving as they're um, in the different portions of their life cycle. Uh, originally, we were told that they just go up and down the same trees and then the adults will just hop and glide and um, they can't fly far or anything like that. And so to answer that question, how far those nymphs can actually move, uh, you wanna advance the, uh, the screen there, Trent. What they did was they designed an experiment in a contiguous forest where they released at that center point of the wheel and then had the radiuses marked out and flagged every five meters. And so what they would do was roll collected nymphs at the different um, life stages, um, roll them in a day glow fluorescent powder and then release them. And then at 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, and one week after the release, they would go out at night with ultraviolet lights and ultraviolet lasers and that day glow powder, you want to advance again? That day glow powder 
lights up like a Christmas tree bulb in a tree at night. And it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And if you've never taken an ultraviolet light out in the forest at night, just what's going through the leaf litter is just amazing. Giant millipedes and, and snails and things that the ultraviolet lights pick up that you never knew were there. But anyway, the, um, the releasing of them, uh, you can see the picture on the left with the pink. They, yeah, go ahead and advance it. What that showed was uh, essentially they were moving seven days as a, as a median was 20 meters. So you're talking 60 feet. 60 feet, at something that's that small, can't fly, they're in constant motion. The max distance was 65 meters, 10 days post-release. And so you think about that just continually from, from uh, the May hatch all the way through to mid to end of July, they're in constant motion. So they can cover a fair amount of ground. And that, that's going to come into play when it's time to treat and try and deal with these on your properties. But uh, go, go ahead and advance again. And one, one of the things that, and click on that video should light up. One of the problems that we think we were seeing was that the powder itself was affecting, if you advance, Trent, is it gonna play? Yeah, it's playing. Okay. So yeah, it's, a, it's showing a little slow on my end, but the, the powder itself was caking them up and um, maybe slowing them down. So, um, it may have affected and artificially limited how far they actually would have gone without the powder being covered, um, the powder covering on them. But uh, the other thing is we've had massive amounts of rainfall the last two years in Southeast PA, um, and it's it's been an issue. Yeah, go ahead and advance. I'll, I'll just keep talking if you're good with that. Yeah. This, this was a report out of commercial production nursery that we got last year in the spring. In this particular nursery we've been working with, uh, been heavily involved with, with trying to help, uh, they've been involved with trying to help us. And one particular variety of red maple um, was just absolutely hammered in the fall of 18 by the adults. And so then we got these, this call that they were seeing this kind of strange um, destruction in these, in these maples that were so fe heavily fed upon the uh, Department of Agriculture Path Lab came out and uh, did sampling. We came out, did sampling, sent it to our path lab, and nothing, uh, nothing was coming back. So if you advance it then, another slide. At the same time, we started getting all these reports of what looked like verticillium uh, popping up all over the place in, uh, in the region. And it looked like classic verticillium in uh, red maples, particularly street trees, trees that were already stressed. And it made sense. We were double our average rainfall in 18. Um, verticillium was the, was the quick guess. And then we sent the, uh, the samples into our path lab and nothing came back with verticillium. So if you advance again, another slide, and then one more, there you go. So this is the, the side by side of what was taking place in that nursery and what was taking place in those street trees when we went back and looked at the branch unions where we, we hadn't necessarily looked that closely because grabbing verticillium samples, you gotta catch it out on the live tissue to get it cultured right. Um, lo and behold, we started seeing these, these types of necrotic pockets popping up everywhere. And I wanna say, as this is recorded, we're not entirely certain this is lanternfly related. But I want to put this out there to more eyes. If you see this, please get in touch with us, get in touch with Trent, get in touch with me. Um, we've ruled out a lot of things right now, and lanternfly is the one thing that we haven't been able to rule out. We're not entirely sure what's taking place and what might be driving it, but um, this is a concern. When you think about red maple street trees, um, just the prevalence everywhere in developments and in, in subdivisions and shopping centers. Uh, this is potentially going to be a huge problem. Put it on your radar. Be aware. Look for it. If you are finding it, please reach out. Let us know. And uh, we have a whole bunch of people working on it and what's possibly going on across several universities, uh, plant pathologists. And uh, we'll hopefully have some answers coming up shortly.
Yeah, we, we've got to think with all those hits, what damage is being done or, or, or how is it affecting these trees? And we have had an abundance of rainfall, Brian. You're right. It's definitely an interesting question. Uh, so go ahead if you want to explain how they feed, Brian. Sure. And this is part of what we think is going on in those maples. Um, they have a fused proboscis that comes down uh, off the head, but it's, it really looks like it's located between the front two legs. And inside that proboscis, there are two long stylets that it will insert into the air exchange openings in the branches. Uh, when in the first instars, they'll actually just punch a hole right through with their beak into a leaf or something like that. But second, third, fourth adults, they'll use those air exchange uh, stomates and and those stylets will work their way right down in around the other cells and get to the phloem tubes. And once they pierce in, they um, it looks like there might be some salivary enzymes that they're injecting in, which softens up the tissue, gets the flow going, and then they're completely reliant on the turgor pressure of the tree to feed them. And so this is why we see, we think, the most healthy trees, the most vigorous trees being targeted. You can have uh, one species, uh, multiple trees, and number three or number seven on the, on the same property will be the hot host, and the other ones will be fairly left alone. And we think it's because it's got better turgor pressure, and they're, that's what they're zeroing in on. So um, back to those slides of, with the damage in the branches, if they're injecting all that salivary enzyme in and we have a hot host that they're, um, there's just hundreds and hundreds feeding on unchecked, then it's very possible that what we might be seeing is just dead tissue from the salivary enzyme. It's a preliminary thought and take it with a grain of salt, but it's, it's making the most sense at the moment. Perfect. Um. So kind of uh, talk about some of the different control methods that were out there. You know, sticky bands have been used to measure it. Uh, the one thing you have to keep in mind with this is uh, squirrels, birds, and everything else. So you may want to put some sort of uh, chicken wire or anything around that. But what we've seen in our research is they'll actually just build a bridge over the ones that are stuck there to keep continuing to use it and go up. Um, anything else that you would want to add with that, Brian? No, it just it's a, it's labor intensive. If you're going to do it as a service, it's labor intensive. If you have a high population, like Trent said, within a couple hours they'll be it'll be completely full, and they'll just be walking over their dead brethren to get up the tree. So um, there are other options available beyond just sticky paper. Uh, this is beyond fly paper in order to uh, avoid the the non-target catch of squirrels and birds, but. Um, it, it's a labor intensive for, for a commercial operation. Um, if your customer's willing to pay for it, great. But um, most of mine don't want to see me there every four hours changing paper. Absolutely. Uh, so host plant range, I, I think this is really unique, you know, but as Brian was saying, really any living plant, you know, depending on the life cycle stage could work. Uh, they do have favorites uh, in the beginning. I would say the Alanthus, black walnut, uh, different shade trees, uh, non-woodies, uh, the most vigorous and healthy plants. You know, since I've been out with Brian, th that is what I've noticed, that they love the healthiest plants. They're not going after weakened trees or anything like that. Uh, you, you can see trees that have been hot, as Brian said, and literally when they're gone, if it's sunny out, it, it's like it's raining honeydew on you. You know, uh, and it's a real mess uh, for your customers that will have the nice decks or patios, uh, anything like that. It, it can become an issue in that aspect of it. Uh, silver maples, birch, uh, red maples, you know, uh, I've seen them on pears, uh, crepe myrtles. You know, the only thing that I haven't really seen them on yet, but doesn't mean would be oaks. Uh, have you seen them on oaks yet, Brian? Yeah, we have. And and what I'll add to this is that they will feed on what's available. It, it's a matter of what's in the proximity. No two properties are the same. You have to take a look. You have to do your scouting. Look for the most um, likely targets first. And then the other thing I'll add to that is once the tree starts to senesce, 
then these guys move. They're relying on that phloem, that turger. Then uh, you, you think about walnut is a very late leaf out and a very early uh, senesce. Once those walnuts senesce, they're gone. There's no sap flow, they're moving on. And that's the, the mobility challenge with this bug. So um, when I see them on oaks is generally, if the oak is the only big healthy plant in the, in the immediate proximity, or if they are, um, if it's very late, I think it was 2017, it, we didn't have a hard freeze until uh, mid-November. Most everything had dropped its leaves at that point, but the oaks were still holding. And so they actually moved into oak and hickory at that point. They, they will just keep going until the, the hard freeze kills them. Yeah, there's, there's uh, Dr. Don's study from Limerick that we did, and we used, uh, he, he came up with the idea of using upside down umbrellas to catch the uh, dead insects from the treatments. And you can see right there uh, what three months of sooty mold does. Um, that's, that's the same umbrella. And so you imagine this with Trek stacking, with uh, paper patios that are fairly porous concrete, uh, cars, if you have trees over driveways, that, that sooty mold gets going from the honeydew and it is uh, nasty to try and clean out of things and it, and it makes life miserable. If you can't use your patio, you can't use your deck, uh, it's, it, is a, uh, it is a difficult thing to deal with. And it was amazing that uh, the homeowners actually left the umbrellas alone for three months as we did the study. It was very impressive. Yeah, it's a great development. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the best management practice, Brian, and talk about it a little bit. Well, scraping eggs is, is always a good thing. If you see them, scrape them. Um, just all you have to do, you don't have to scrape them into, into alcohol if you don't want to. You see them, just pop them like zits. You'll know if it's a fresh one. Uh, this year's, they'll, they'll be nice and gooey. The old ones will remain for a couple of years. And if you look close, you'll see the opening where they emerged and they kind of dry out. But um, from a commercial aspect, we've documented the eggs right up 70 foot was the max that we've we've documented them and some of the work that I was doing this past winter was physically just dropping trees on the edges of fence rows and seeing uh, measuring out how high up the egg placement was and two-thirds of the eggs are are uh, in the upper two-thirds of the canopy so for every one that you're seeing in the first six to eight feet uh, there's at least two more above and so from a commercial standpoint uh, I've seen people offering egg scraping services to customers. I, I, I think it's just kind of, uh, you know, trying to empty the ocean with, with a bucket. But you, if you see them, scrape them. It doesn't hurt to, to get rid of them in any way, shape, or form. Dormant oil, I'm not entirely sold on. I know Dr. Don's doing some work with that, with different treatments for treating egg masses. The results on dormant oil from the Penn State Bio uh, biocide uh, assays are just all over the place. There's very little consistency. Uh, I know Golden Oil just put out a press release about they've added bottle lantern fly to their label. Um, I don't see it in the uh, in the test results. Uh, tree traps, sticky bands, we've talked about that. Um, they can be effective. You can catch thousands and thousands quickly. It's labor intensive. Uh, contact insecticide applications you know, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing if you have a population in a given spot at one time. Um, like I said, they can be there one day, go on the next, as Trent was saying, they moved through the development almost, uh, you know, one end to the other on, on a steady march day after day. But if you see them feeding on, on a plant, you can use your, your um, insecticidal soaps, your neem oils, things like that. And that's really more for uh, the homeowners. It's try and keep them towards the benign uh, products. We've seen all kinds of horrible things with people spraying their trees with kerosene, cases of wasp and hornet spray. They're spraying 20 feet up in the trees and then it's raining back down on, on the homeowner. Um, just things that are just absolute pesticide no-nos. Um, the soil drench system application, there's, um, there's some varying degrees with that. I will tell you that a midicloper drench in uh, August and September showed just abysmal results. If you're doing soil injection, I am not convinced at all that imidacloprid in uh, August and September 
is going to have any positive outcome for you. We're going back and looking at the earlier applications now this year. And then you have your, um, your trunk spray, your tree injection. And this is really the most professional way, I believe, to do it if you're going to be using your nicot nicotinoids and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, as far as contact insecticides, back to that a second, there are the longer residuals that are good for up to about 20 days with the bifenthrin and um, beta cyfluthrin, which is usually sold as a tempo. That is a good product if you have, say, um, shrubs, um, non-flowering plants, you gotta watch the pollinators, but it will give you residual contact if you don't wanna go heavy duty neonic at that point. So there are options. Penn State has some great stuff published on their website. Yeah. Great, great. So uh, site conditions, you know, uh, these are questions you're going to ask yourself when you're coming out on the property. What plants are on site, you know? Are there any of these plants going to be considered hot plants, as Brian have, have I talked about? And how many trees are on site need to be treated? And will I be going off label if I'm doing some of the application choices that are out there? You know, if, if you're using injections, you're definitely being environmentally responsible and you don't have any uh, label limits with that, which is key. And then you have your bark spray, soil drenches and foliar sprays that we can talk about. Um, I, I think this is really interesting, Brian, if you wanna talk about this, uh, since this is kind of what you saw, it's truly amazing to me. Yeah, this, this is where those numbers get staggering. Um, a customer with a silver maple tree who's a retired research scientist and she literally went out and swept her patio and every 24 hours over a three month period after I treated the tree and uh, using a, a representative grid sample, like I said, she's a retired scientist. She, um, we documented 48,000 killed off that single tree. And so you think about what the un, unchecked feeding would be on those trees and we're getting to those the strange damage we're getting into, um, you know, an unknown territory. How much sap loss like that can these trees take? And that picture underneath the uh, chart, you can see it's a silver maple that was actually, uh, we've seen this just all over the place, seems to be silver maple more. Um, you see full leaf, that, that tree is in full leaf. It's not really begun senescing and yet it's pushing that to your, next year's buds, almost like if it was a defoliation event. Uh, like you'd have with uh, a chemical app misuse or um, after a drought, you'll see plants send a second second uh, set of buds. And we're seeing this take place where we see this ginormous uh, bud swelling going on in the fall, in September and October, almost like the tree is so stressed it doesn't, doesn't it's not getting its, its uh, nutrients to its roots, it's triggering, it might be uh, phytoplasmas in the sal saliva of the insects that are actually changing the, uh, the hormonal structures of the trees themselves. It's being researched. We have no idea what's going on, but um, you know, we're seeing these strange things happening with unchecked feeding, so. Absolutely. And just to show you some of the agricultural photos that are out there, I mean, how serious, Brian, uh, what are the vineyards doing in your area? Can you talk a little bit about that, how severe it's been? The worst case scenario I saw is a 40 acre vineyard just got bulldozed last year. Three years of attack from lanternfly. Uh, as much of it uh, as this is a nuisance and a problem for us on the ornamental side, I would not be want to be a vineyard owner with this insect. It, it is just relentless. Um, the, the vineyard that got, got bulldozed was um, one of the first ones hit. Subsequent ones are doing a little bit better with control, but even at that with control, they are making application after application. The ground is just covered in, in dead bodies. You, you can't kneel down without squishing dead bodies, and they're still coming in. You're finding 100 per plant, 100 per, per vine. Uh, so in that adult phase, they feed voraciously. They're not bothering the fruit itself. It's the uh, decline in production because the, the vines are struggling so so much. It's the honeydew production. It's the sooty mold growth on the the uh, grapes that makes them unusable. So uh, you can see in that picture the the honeydew all on the leaves. Well, in in a week that's going to be all black sooty mold. So it, it, grapes are probably the biggest agricultural uh, concern at the moment. 
the tree fruits i'm not as concerned it's not as heavily hit now this is a, this is the great picture to show me wrong but what you can't see in this picture is it's a monoblock uh, monoculture block of apple production and that's uh roughly about 120 acres on that block and so when they come through that when they came through that block they have to feed they don't go very long 24 48 hours without feeding and if the apple trees are there that's what they're going to feed on and then they're going to move on uh, generally with apples but if it's the only thing available that's what they're going to eat again then we have the honey uh, honeydew and sooty mold productions i saw in the chat box earlier i answered the question about vectoring uh, disease you know we, we we have this concern it is a possibility that they will be able to vector something like a fire blight or um, some type of virus. We've not seen it. We're looking actively. We're testing it as best we can in lab, but we don't know yet. And if this bug, while it may not be a primary host of the apples, if this bug can start transmitting diseases of the apple trees, then all of a sudden all bets are off. We have a whole new problem on our hands. Uh, in the grapes, there are some concerns that they are moving a virus, and that's being studied. Uh, Penn State's working on that this year. Awesome. Uh, hot trees, just to give you some idea, guys, of photos of what they look like. I mean, it, it's just truly amazing when they're just completely covered. I mean, top to bottom. Uh, and, and then the next day, they could be gone. You know, they, they move in waves. It's truly amazing. Um, and moving on now, kind of insecticide options. <clears throat> what we've determined, guys, is our uh, best approach would be an injection of our Imagent product in June, which could give you should give you season-long control. Uh, we did have some issues last year with uh, populations being higher in some areas, and then you may need to do a follow-up injection of like our Ace Jet if, if, if it deems necessary. Uh, bark sprays have been effective. But timing is really key on that. You don't want to go out too early because uh, with as much rain as we have, it, it can flow through the tree fairly quickly, you know, and you have to take in the label limits into account. Uh, any other advice on that, Brian, that you can talk about on, on the different timings? No, it's a, it's, it's a mobile insect. We've seen areas that had it real bad in previous years that it didn't, it wasn't as much of a problem uh, this past year. And then after that, we see the, um, you know, the population move back in as the trees seem to recover a little bit. We saw a mass influx really late in the season and uh, it was too late to treat. You know, the trees were shutting down, but they had enough time to lay eggs. So um, trying to predict where it's going to be, you guys are going to have to get out and scout, do your homework. And, um, and uh, generally, if you have a hot tree the previous year, it's going to be hot you know, the following year. So that'll give you a good indication where to start with your treatment. Unless you have unlimited checkbook uh, from your customer, it gets expensive for them quick and um, on the bigger trees and you're gonna have to uh, be as professional as you can and do, do the best you can for them. Absolutely, and I just saw in the chat question, uh, someone asked if uh, we saw absence of spotted linerfly on ash that's been treated uh, with emectin benzoate. We, we, we have seen some uh, effectiveness of emectin benzoate on it, but I don't know if it was enough to keep them off of it. And I don't know, Brian, if you saw any uh, ash trees with lanternfly on them. It's, it's more like a passing thing. Um, if they're, it's not a preferred host in any way, shape or form. That said, um, you know, there's so many ash where I'm at, they're, they're just really hitting their, their, their big downfall right now. Um, so it's a, if there's a healthy tree there and they need to feed, they're going to feed. But from my experience, they're not going to stay put on if uh, there's maple around. Maple, ash, uh, alanth uh, not ash, uh, maple, uh, walnut, alanthus, um, those would be more preferred. So it's, it's going to be down to the proximity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, moving ahead, just to kind of give you some uh, data of what we saw with results with our injection of Imaget uh, in 2018. Uh, as we saw an increase versus uh, the untreated not having anything under them. Uh, so uh, our proven solution with that is the Imaget product for you guys. Uh, please uh, reach out to me if you have more questions about it. 
And if you are some of our customers, we have this great website uh, started here to find professionals uh, and, and for homeowners. If you're that and want to find out more information, this is a great place to go and look. And uh, questions, let's open up for questions now. And Brian, thank you for uh, joining us today. It's been great. Zach, you have, see any questions that you want to bring up? Hey, Trent. Uh, so, Brian, thank you guys very much. Uh, so you guys did a great job answering the questions as they went through. Um, but again, if anyone's got anything else that's just kind of popped into their head, feel free to, to type it in. Uh, raise your hand. There's a little raise your hand button somewhere on Zoom. Um, also, don't forget to copy and paste that Google Sheet link uh, in the in the chat line into a web browser, so you can fill out that. Um, also, put your you can put your ISA number in the chat feature if you want to just double check and make sure you got it to there. Uh, a couple questions popping in now. Uh, Denny's asking if uh, our slides will be available to use in um, presentations he might need to make to customers or to um, anyone he's you know trying to get in information in front of? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to put something together for him, yes. Cool. And uh, let's see, oh, here we go. They're coming in so fast now. Uh, the antipathogens, I can, I can tell you that. Let's see, what about any news on, yeah, antipathogens, yeah. Brian, if you want to handle yeah, that. Yeah, so that's, uh, there's two, two major ones that have been found. It's the uh, Bavaria bassiana, which is already available as a labeled insecticide. Uh, Bottega and I believe Apprehend are the two names, uh, trade names. We've done some trials in uh, Norristown with it and uh, last year had good enough success that we we're looking right now at doing some aerial applications with helicopters on a broader scale basis uh, coming up this spring. That is a um, ongoing and hopefully we will have uh, some very good data on that coming up. Uh, it, the Bavaria is native in the, in the soil. The problem is we see it doesn't really uh, get going until the fall with the cool down and the damp weather. So we're trying to see if we can up those um, results by putting it up in the trees earlier. But we have to look at all the non-targets, the honeybees, the solitary bees, all that stuff. That's where we're at with it. The other one was the Bacoa Major. Bacoa Major, there's no commercial formulation for it, and uh, it's a scramble to figure out even what it's doing and why, and uh, that that's where they are right now. Awesome. Uh, Mark is asking, with the presence in extreme western Pennsylvania, guesstimate about rate of progression across Ohio. I know it has crossed because uh, Kevin Lewis, our, mid, uh, our Midwest RTM, ha has found it. Um, but Trent, Brian, any idea of how fast it might spread across Ohio? It's going to go back to um, it's going to go back to human assisted movement. Uh, with my customer base, we saw a natural infill spread about five to seven miles. A day. When you look at it getting across the state in, in just a few years since it's discovered, that's human movement. Eggs being moved. It's uh, or, or adults uh, hitchhiking on vehicles. So. Judging on how long it took to get across Pennsylvania, you know, with human movement, maybe another year it might already be there and just not noticed yet. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as far as uh, ArborJet is concerned, you know, we have had reports that it is in Ohio. So, um, you know, kind of like with everything else, I would almost assume that it's somewhere by now, especially with the. Um, you know, with movement of firewood or whatever, as Brian said, it sticks to just about anything that's got a surface to it. Yep, RVs get parked for the summer or for the fall, and then they get started up and driven to a campground or something, and they get just in time for the hatch out in the spring, things like that. Um, that's how it's it's been moving. All right. Uh, next one I've, that's popping up, ha have you seen any differences in force that have been prescribed burned versus not? I've not seen anything to do with that. No basis for it that I know. Okay. 
Trent, anything to add to that? Uh, I have not seen anything in that instance. Uh, I, I did see a comment about movement railroads another way, uh, you know, trucks, uh, trailers sitting in yards, stuff like that. Uh, races, you know, uh, your, your local races, uh, cars moving in. Those are all means that it can be moved. Okay. Uh, let's see. Are they less likely to spread into the mountain region of North Carolina or just mountain regions in general? Are they more likely to be found towards the coast? So one, one of uh, the people I work with is uh, Dr. Calvin has been doing a great job of the modeling uh, with this. There's some, some concern back and forth whether how, how important that Atlantis uh, is in the diet uh, based on Atlantis availability and then the other question is growing degree days and there's a there's going to be absolute limits where it's not going to have enough growing to degree days to get all the way to the egg laying portion of its cycle so in terms of north carolina mountains um depending on the on the, the climate there i'm not overly familiar with if it's cool enough not enough degree days then it will be limited um, the bigger concern that we have as we're heading south of the mason dixon line now is uh, with with the bug is if it gets to a point where there's no hard freeze to fill it to, or to kill it off, what's going to happen? Is it going to just continue on and continue laying eggs? Because these things can lay multiple egg cases per insect and they're just limited by time and nutrients. So if it gets all the way down south, you know, it's possible that it will just be a constant insect. Scary. Yeah. Um, Brian, from your years of, of looking at this, have you seen any difference if you sterilize your drill if you're going from tree to tree when you in, when you inject with a, a medical I I would give that one back to uh, to Trent, but I always make a practice of of sterilizing um, just because we, with all the rain we've seen a whole lot of um, uh, uh, Phytophthora issues, and uh, we just. I, I don't want to be the one responsible for, for presenting that to a healthy tree. So right. it's good practice to carry extra bits, keep them in, in uh, mm -hmm. uh, rubbing alcohol or um, you know some other sterilization method. I, I agree with that, Brian. I agree with that. I think it's good practice and the way diseases and everything are moving now, I, I think it's great practice. Um. Depending on what your answer to this is, it could be scary. Have you seen any indication of resistance to any treatments that you found useful? Uh, not to this date. Um, if, if, as you notice, sir, we're we're talking mainly um, mainly about one class of uh, insecticides is our heavy hitter, and that's the neonex, mm -hmm. um, both in the same rat class. So. You know, I know, I know Dr. Don is doing a lot of work with this, with other materials, and um, it's a, um, it's a concern. Have we seen it? No. Uh, one of the reasons that we are going to have some time with this is because it's univoltine. It's one generation per year. Um, that it's not like an aphid reproducing uh, that exponential rate, you know, uh, multiple times through, through short period. It's, it's one generation per year, and because of that, the, the genetic uh, change required for resistance is not going to happen as fast as you would have like a bacteria, a virus, uh, an aphid. So it's a concern. It's definitely a concern. It's not as much a concern as you would, it might have with, with a much faster reproducing uh, pest. Okay. And it also, you know, it hasn't been around and studied long enough to possibly find out so no, no it's, we wouldn't know at this point really if, uh, just the short years it's it's the short number of years we've had mm -hmm. to deal with it yeah all right next question so if if a hot tree is found full of adults what would you think or what what do you recommend as your best management practice to to take care of that tree the first thing i would do is is um, take a look at what the tree is um if you can get the information from the homeowner, if it's an Atlantis, you know they're gonna be staying on it. If it's a, it's a red maple, silver maple, they're gonna be staying on it. If it's an oddball, Kwanzaa cherry, something like that, it may be that they were moving 
they stop to get that meal and they're going to be moving on anyway, it might not be worth treating. Uh, so first thing you do is look at the type of tree, find out how long they've been there to feed. And then uh, from there, from treatment, uh, depends on the time of the year, how late it is. If you're getting into the savannas and, um, and the eggs are already laid, you're just kind of wasting money for your customer. Sure. You know, balance it out. What time of year is it? If it's early in the uh, in the adult phase, go ahead and treat it. Um, do what you can. Try and try knock them down. All right. Um, have you found one type of transportation to be more common as a vector than another? I I don't I don't study in that. That's okay. uh, Department of Agriculture is, is is that's their department. Um, sure. But any any type of um, material can be it. You know, you can have firewood, you can have an old grill, you can have a couch cushion, you could have trash, you could have. We did uh, one place we were looking at. There was a uh, a tree house uh, that the tree had come over this past winter, and the tree itself didn't have that many eggs, but the boards where they were attached to the tree were absolutely slathered that we just went and cut the pieces of the treehouse out and gave them over to the quarantine lab to hatch out. Um, so it's, it's a, they can be on just about anything when they find some, an area that they like one, one starts it off and they all get going. Um, you'll have outliers, but they, they tend to group uh, pretty much. Okay. Uh, next question I'll take the, do you close the wound after injection? Uh, so Al Alberto, the, one of the biggest pieces about, doing an arbor jet injection is to use the arbor plug at which closes your injection site already. So um, yeah, we always recommend closing the site, but we do it all just about during slash before the injection with a plug. Um, are we have someone in Lancaster County, a question about efficacy of image or the effectiveness of image at later in the season, like if they missed the June window and did the injection in August or September, should they expect dead flies at the base of the tree to trees? Any advice on that? I would say uh, September, I don't know if I would be doing injections that late because it's so late in the season. Uh, August, you know, you, you got to choose a cutoff point. Uh, but it also depends, you know, if it was dry, you know, what, how were, were the trees uptaking? Was it wet? You know, uh, those are all going to be factors. I, I had some customers call me that they weren't seeing stuff. Uh, it, it depends on the movement of the bug too. Uh, how, how was the population, uh, Dave, in that? And, and we, I can talk to you offline more about it too uh, to get it. Uh, Brian, did you see anything at that time of the year uh, with different patterns in that aspect of it? Um, yeah, I agree with you. It depends on, uh, it can depend on weather. Uh, last year we saw a slow uptake in September. We had a little bit of a dry spell. Uh, it definitely seemed to affect the uptake. Um, it's a, it's a tough one to, um, it, there's so much variability, especially with weather and, uh, and site conditions. So, um, we had a trial site in Allentown where I was getting great uptake in, in September trial site in uh, near Skipback, Pennsylvania, Montgomery County, a uh, horrible uptake in September and, and Skipback was just a little bit of a micro drought at that time. So um, weather conditions are, are all going to affect all that stuff. Um, and that's across the board with your treatments. Absolutely. Karen, I'm going to have, I'm going to throw this one to you because um, you deal quite a bit with bacterial leaf scorch and fire blight and, and a couple other diseases, but uh, when it comes to disinfecting your drill bits, what agents, like what type of product do you use and is there a good dilution rate that you, that you go with for, for uh, sterilizing your bits? I, typically, I, I'll use like an alcohol, rubbing alcohol, maybe mix it with some water, you know, something like that or a spray bottle. Uh, I've seen guys use our actual clean jet as an alcohol uh, sterilization. Uh, I've seen other guys use Lysol, you know, it's real quick. They just spray it and do it. Uh, but I, I like rubbing alcohol in a spray bottle, you know, it's right there in my kit. I spray it down in between and go. Okay. 
Uh, any particular dilution? Do you know off the top of your head the percent uh, active? I, I I think I'll have to look, but it's typically just by uh, plain rubbing alcohol, like okay. what you have out, Zach. Yep. So yeah, that's usually you know what I have in my cabinets. Uh, usually buy it from the CVS. So like it's like a three percent dilute solution. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the last question in here is. Uh, from Robin, good question. Uh, do eggs need an overwinter or cold period to hatch? Nope. Um, it, they, they do not require that, that cool down period. It doesn't look like it at this point. Um, the, some of the people that were collecting for the quarantine labs, they took them right from the field and started hatching this past fall. So hmm. um, no diapause required. Uh, and uh, the, the less exposure to uh, deep freeze they seem to come out of the winter faster as well. So, um, and more uniformly. So the, um, the, that's, I don't know how much we, we discussed, but the, uh, the hatch rate, you can have an individual egg, egg mass that will hatch over multiple days. They don't all pop out on the same day. Uh, I think it's roughly five to seven days is the average hatch period for an individual egg mass. And then next mass next to it might not start for another week. Uh, so there's there's a big variation, and that hatch timing can last about a month overall. And uh, doesn't look like they need that winter diet pause. Wow. All right. So we made it through all the questions. Um, so Trent, Brian, thank you guys so much. A lot of really good information. Uh, the last slide that uh, the attendees can see up there, that's the, our list of uh, presentations that are coming up in the next uh, next uh, week, uh, up until next Friday. We do have more scheduled after that, but you know, we put all of them up there. It gets a little small. You can also always just visit the, the ArborJet website uh, up there, arborjet.com slash webinars. Uh, also, if you just go to arborjet.com, it's usually the first banner at the top of the page. No. But lots of really good questions, guys. Uh, everyone, thanks for sticking around. Uh, it's been a, a really a good a really good webinar. A lot of really good information. Brian, thank you so much for taking time out of your day uh, to to spend it with all our attendees. Uh, it was great talking with you, Trent. As always, it's a pleasure. Um, and as for that, I'm gonna stop the recording and.